Welcome to the Amgen Biotech Experience Program. My name is Alia Katarna, and I'm the Site Coordinator for ABE Massachusetts. Today, I will be discussing my favorite lab, Laboratory 5. During Laboratory 5, students learn how to use bacterial transformation in order for specific E. coli cells to take up their specific plasmid in order to express and replicate the genes of interest. In this case, it's RFP. Since the ultimate goal is to produce large amounts of the desired protein, scientists rely on prokaryotic organisms to replicate the plasmids and express the desired genes. By replacing the recombinant plasmid into bacteria, scientists can use bacteria to produce huge quantities of desired therapeutic proteins. Because we are using bacterial competent cells for Laboratory 5, it's important for students to wear safety goggles and gloves throughout the entire lab. The other important thing about safety with this lab is we want to make sure that our bench top is clean. There are two key reagents that come with your kit for Laboratory 5. One will be bacterial competence cells, and the second, your plates. The first thing that you need to do when you receive these reagents is take your competence cells out and put them in the freezer as soon as possible. It's incredibly important to keep these frozen at all times before use. So as you can see here, I have my competent cells on ice. When you receive your plates, you want to put them in the fridge as soon as possible and make sure that you store them upside down. One piece of equipment that you will receive for Laboratory 5 is the water bath. It's important to calibrate your water bath to 42 degrees the day before the lab. That way, the day of your lab, you could just turn your water bath on, it'll be set to 42, and you don't have to worry about it. In preparation for Laboratory 5, there's really not much you could do in advance. Regarding the cells, you want to take them out of the freezer and have them thaw only 15 minutes before use. These guys are going to thaw really quickly. In regards to the plates, you could take them out of the fridge and let them get to room temperature and that will be fine. Once the bacterial cells have completely thawed, you must aliquot them out into cold tubes for your students. Place these tubes on ice until your students are ready to use them. The other freezer reagent that you are going to be using is the plasmid. For students who are doing Laboratory 5, they're going to be using their ligated product that they created during Labs 2 and 3 and that they verified in Lab 4. For students who are participating in Lab 5A or 5B, they'll be using the provided plasmid that contains the RFP gene. So we need to get these bacterial competent cells onto our plates. How do we do that? Well, the first step is aliquoting our cells from the stock into our tubes. We have one tube that's plus and one tube that's minus. The plus signifies that the competent cells will be mixed with our plasmid, and the minus means there'll be no plasmid in that tube. Students will be given 100 microliters of competent cells. When they receive these cells, before they aliquot into their tubes, they must pump up and down. So I go to the first stop, put my tip in, and pump up and down. This is to ensure that your students get an adequate amount of cells and not just the buffer that these cells are sitting in. I will then pipette the 50 microliters into my cold tube, get rid of my tip in a specific biohazard bag waste container, and do the same for the next tube. I have two tubes for a reason. One tube has a minus on the top, and the other tube has a plus. And this is to denote the addition, or lack thereof, the plasmid. So right now, I have two tubes with 50 microliters of my E. coli competent cells in them on ice. Next, students will add the appropriate plasmid to the appropriate tube. Then those tubes will be placed in the water bath for the heat shock. The heat shock is very quick. It's only 45 seconds, so it's important for students to denote the start and end time. Once your cells have been heat shocked, you then add LB to both samples. After you add your LB, these tubes can remain at room temperature. Now, we need to get these cells onto the plates. So here I have three plates 
one denoted with one line for the LB plate. The second, two lines for your LB plus the antibiotic. And the third, your LB, the antibiotic, as well as the sugar called arabinose. It's important for your students to be as sterile as possible with this lab. When plating, you don't want students to open up the covers and just leave them. You don't want students to pick up the plates. Sometimes they even joke with students and pretend I'm about to lick it or sneeze on it. That's not what we're going to do. What you want students to do is to just clamshell the plate. So what I mean by that is instead of lifting the plate entirely open, minimize how open the plate is so that no other bacteria can get on the plate and thus grow and mess up your results. So I am just plating on the top, get rid of my tip, and move on. Another key tip when plating is not to gouge the agar with your tip. Tips are incredibly sharp. So what you want to do when plating is just hover over your agar plate and just aliquot your solution out and have it drip down. One thing that we see students do is gouge the agar, and I'll show you what that looks like. Students will pipette their sample and then touch and actually poke the agar so that their solution or their sample is no longer on top of the agar, but it's inside, and that is incorrect. Once your sample is on the agar, you have to spread it. So you do so by, again, the clamshell, and you use your sterile stick, your sterile hockey stick, to spread your sample around. As you can see, I'm only spreading the minuses right now, and I'm using the same stick, and this is okay. As long as you go from LB plate to then LB with the antibiotic, then I dispose of that. Once you've spread your E. coli cells that don't have the plasmid, your students can move on to pipetting the competent cells that have the plasmid. So I'm going to take 50 microliters of my plus, add it to my plus side. We're using the clamshell technique. Close it. I could even use the same tip to get another 50 microliters. Plus side of my LB plus the antibiotic plate. And for my arabinose plate, I'm going to want to use double. So I'll do 50 microliters once, close it, and then do another 50 microliters for a total of 100 microliters on this plate. Dispose of the tip, and then I can move on to spreading. Spreading, again, you want to clamshell your plate and just spread that sample only on the plus side. As you can see, I'm moving from LB plate to LB plus antibiotic to finally the LB plus antibiotic plus the sugar arabinose. One mistake that we see students do is plate out of sequence. So if we were to switch the LB antibiotic plate with the LB antibiotic plus arabinose plate and spread one, two, and three, what could happen is your spreader could pick up some of the sugar arabinose from that arabinose plate and move it over to the LB antibiotic plate. And this will mess up your expected results. Another mistake we see is that students pipette a specific sample to the wrong side of the plate. For example, your LB plate has a plus on one side and the minus on the other. They'll actually pipette the plus sample to the minus side. Now, this won't affect your expected results for this plate specifically, but for your LB plus the antibiotic, it will truly mess up those expected results. If you have a short class period, don't worry about it. I've actually completed this lab in 47 minutes, but if you don't feel comfortable rushing through the lab, what you could do is you could pause. And you could pause after your heat shock, post your students adding the LB to both samples. Those samples could then be refrigerated overnight, 
and then you can continue with the bacterial transformation the next day. So I mentioned that this lab is my favorite and I'll tell you why. It has the biggest wow factor, not just for students but for teachers as well. I tell you, when students and teachers come in the next day to see that arabinose plate, they are blown away. So what to expect? Well, you should have growth on your arabinose plate, that's for sure. But there's something that's different about the growth on this arabinose plate versus the growth on the positive side of your plus antibiotic plate. And that is that the cells and colonies on this arabinose plate should be pink. So here's an example of a plate. And this plate is on a blue LED light. And you can see that the colonies that are expressing RFP are actually glowing. There are small colonies, and that's OK. We know that the transformation worked because, one, these cells are growing in the presence of an antibiotic. And two, the RFP is turned on because of the arabinose, thus allowing these colonies to fluoresce. You think it is easy, but it's pretty tricky for bacteria to stick with me. The cell wall is complex and we don't use conjugation to get our plasmids inside yep, for replication. So we make them competent when calcium get onto it. No negative charge, we're all over it. We disrupt the membrane with the pressure change, then we heat for 45. The science insane. And that's lab five. That's why it's my favorite.